Yeah, it's good to see everyone. Um, just to exp explain on the uh, the notice about the um, joy, you know, training. Um, we thought it'd be great to have uh, some food together, breakfast. So I know it's an early start on a Saturday, um, but if you would like to help out with the sound desk, the words for projecting the things on the screen, uh, or even the cameras, please do uh, find me before you go or send me an email. I know you know some of you have already uh, mentioned that you'd like to be involved. Um, yeah, it'd be great to get some people together. And once I've got everyone's names, I'll uh, send an email to everyone just to confirm what we're doing. But we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna cook a breakfast here. Um, there'll probably be some cereal and stuff if you don't like cooked breakfast, but we'll probably spend the first maybe half an hour uh, just eating together and just, uh, yeah, spending some time. And then we'll get to the uh, technical stuff because it'd be great to have more people on the team and uh, yeah we'll try and get the church nice and warm as well uh, hopefully the weather will have warmed up by next week um, but yeah so please do come and see me if you uh, are happy to help on any of those three teams uh, we're going to continue in Esther um, very challenging book um, because it's never clear cut what's going on and often there isn't much information to go off um, but we're going to try and wrestle with that this morning, but let's pray before we begin, um, and then we'll get into it. Father God, thank you for your people. Thank you for the church. Thank you for everyone here this morning. Thank you that you uh, haven't brought them here by mistake, but you have brought each of us here um, to hear from you. And I pray that as we read your word together, as we um, study it, as we try and find something that you want to teach us individually but as a church and as a people of uh, as your people pray that you'd anoint the words that are spoken uh, and that your holy spirit would empower us to be able to listen uh, hear the words uh, put them into practice and yeah become more like you jesus uh, we pray we'll be able to learn from all the characters in this story um however confusing or, um, yeah, pray that your Holy Spirit in us would be able to give us the answers that we're looking for. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, just going to yeah, put a disclaimer out there that chapter two, um, there is so much um, that maybe is you need to wrestle with. Uh, it, might, it challenges our thinking. Um, obviously, it's an ancient um, culture, and so there'll be a lot of things that are very alien to us, but then there are a lot of things that we're like, is that right? Is that, is that really how we should do things? Um, but it's in the Bible. God's got it in there for a reason. Um, sometimes it can challenge our religious mindset. Um, but yeah, and it's... Yeah, it's a difficult passage. So let's read it together. Um, just a reminder for last time I spoke, kind of introduced the context, and we see that Xerxes, this powerful king, is a terrible, terrible man. However, God uses some of the worst people in the world to achieve his uh, plan for mankind. And it's God that gets the glory, or should be God that gets the glory. Just because God uses someone doesn't necessarily mean that he approves of them. Uh, sometimes we can, as, as Christians, we can sometimes give glory to man and think that it's something special about this man or woman uh, that God's chosen. But the reality is the only person who's worth receiving glory is God. Whether, and that applies to this whole story, whether it's Esther, Xerxes, Vashti, Mordecai. Um, everyone in the story isn't perfect. And there's a lot of, I guess, gray areas. Uh, but we know that the one person that isn't mentioned is perfect. And that's God himself. So, um, yeah. Let's uh, continue. So Vashti's been de deposed. Uh, they had a very dysfunctional relationship. Uh, yep, terrible husband, uh, possibly, we don't know. Um, there's clearly a power imbalance, um, and he's using that. Uh, but we also, 
maybe there is suggestions that Queen Vashti um, maybe didn't necessarily have the best attitude, but it's very hard to know for sure. So let's read chapter two. It says, but after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Hegai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimei. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiakim of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. <clears throat> as a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Hegai's care. Hegai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. <coughs> he quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids, specially chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. Every day, Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatment, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem where the king's wives lived. There, she would be under the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless he had especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle. <coughs> Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin, Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Hegai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. <coughs> Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. <coughs> and the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all of his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. One day, as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Thana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. 
She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharp pole, sharpened pole. This was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. <sighs> so, a lot to unpack there. Um, and, yeah, lots of questions. I'm sure you have lots of questions. Uh, I do, I still do. Um, but let's look at what's going on. So, first of all, uh, King Xerxes, very, um, I'd say, petulant, probably, impulsive uh, king who was clearly used to getting his own way in everything. Um, he was obviously very, very powerful. Um, and yet he had been humiliated by this uh, one woman, his uh, Vashti. And so his pride, he was clearly a very proud man. And so he was angry. And it says, after his anger had subsided. And there are lots, you know, anger, a lot of Christians, some, well, I hear a lot of Christians often say, oh, um, I got angry, but then I showed my Christian side. <laughs> and they make the mistake of thinking that anger is not a Christian quality or trait. But that's not true. You know, anger in the right place, in other words, righteous anger, is a really important thing. You know, if someone says, oh, my pastor never gets angry, my teacher never gets angry, my parents never get angry, they're not good teachers, parents, pastors, you know? Actually getting angry about the right things is really, really important. We see Jesus didn't get angry very often, but he did about the right things when the temple was being used to exploit people financially. Um, and if you don't get angry as a Christian, um, you might want to check why that is. You know, if, if nothing ever gets you angry, because you think being a Christian means we don't get angry, then just check your understanding of what it means to be a Christian. So there's righteous anger, but then there's anger that's fed by our pride, proud anger, you know, where we've been made to look stupid or someone's embarrassed us or um, someone's let us down, you know, those sort of things, they're not where you should get angry, you know, you could, there's, there's forgiveness. And it says he began thinking about Vashti, he began thinking about Vashti. <laughs> You know, he started, this was probably the first time he'd actually thought about things from her perspective, you know. Humility allows us to think of ourselves less. I often say, you know, being humble is not thinking less of ourselves. It's not saying, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm terrible. All it is, <clears throat> humility, is thinking of ourselves less and thinking about other people more than ourselves. That's humility. You can be very confident in the fact that you might be very talented, you might be very skilled, you might be very wise. That's fine to think that, you know, to, you know, to know that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, confidence. People often mistake confidence with pride. You know, you can be very self-assured and yet be very, very humble. You know, you could be the best brain surgeon in the world and yet be very, very humble. Um, because you think about others. And he'd started to think about Vashti. It would have been helpful if he'd thought about Vashti in chapter 1, um, instead of just himself. Instead of just himself. Uh, so he thinks about Vashti, what she had done, and the decree he had made, probably thinking, oh, that's really stupid of me. <laughs> I've made this decree. I can't even go against it because his decrees carried that much power. So he was stuck. So what does he do? His personal attendants suggest this plan, and it's to, uh, it appeals to his flesh. You know, um, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. It appeals to his flesh, his lust. It appeals to all of that. And they're telling him what he wants to hear. It says, let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. 
Hegai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they're all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who pleases, most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put it into effect. And in the world, sex is an idol. You know, it, it, sex, money, power, all of these things drive, you know, if you look at marketing, it's all there, money, you know. Buy this, it'll make you rich. Buy this, it'll make you attractive. Buy this, it'll, you know, promise the world. And we have all these idols, and this is how the world works. And so the idol in the king's life here is being worshipped. And so he puts this plan into effect. We also see that Hegai is a eunuch. And a eunuch is a man who has been castrated. Okay, and the reasons for that was to, so they weren't a threat um, to the king because they couldn't have children. Um, they also, well, I won't be too uh, explicit, but we know that, you know, a lot of male tendencies and um, aggression comes from um, the things that are chopped up during castration. And so that's, you know, this is how they treated those men. So they couldn't do the right thing, which would be to stand up to the king's evil. And Satan has always wanted to do this spiritually. You know, we see that evil in this world is often allowed to happen because men who are meant to be protecting women, children, don't stand up for what's right. You know, they may be spiritually castrated you could say so they don't have the um, courage they don't have the um, assertiveness to actually get angry and stand up and fight for what is just and correct and and the enemy seeks to do that you know we see from original Adam and Eve where was Adam was he front and center or was he not taking up his leadership position? You know, and uh, we see that in the world today where there are, you know, weak men not showing leadership, not showing leadership, not standing up for what's right, not leading spiritually, almost being spiritually castrated. And so don't become like Hegai, where you are in a system where you're not standing up for what's right. The enemy has completely kind of um, taken you out of the game so that you can't be a threat to him. Um, yeah, and then they're all given these, you know, the plan is to give them these beauty treatments and unfortunately, the world can, you know, you, you know, use all sorts of beauty treatments, but it doesn't change what's inside, you know? The world's obsessed with changing our outward appearance. But in God's kingdom, he starts by changing us from the inside out. Anyway, so that's the plan. Terrible plan. It's going to exploit lots of young women for just the, to, to appear, um, just to please a lustful king. And if we think that doesn't happen today, it certainly does. Maybe not um, in our country as much as it did here in those times. But obviously, if we know what happens on the internet, there's all sorts of things. Um, you know, if you are a, a young man, an old man, any sort of man, if you want a virtual harem, it's all there on the internet. And so the spirit's still the same today. The spirit that seeks to exploit women, that seeks to um, appeal to lust and promote lust is, is still there. It's still there. In our, we haven't um, evolved as a, you know, we like to think that we've become a more civilized society, but it still happens today, doesn't it? You know, um, rich, powerful men can exploit young women. Anyway, verse 5. 
So let's, we're now introduced to Mordecai. So it says, at the time there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa, whose name was Mordecai, son of Jer. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, descendant of Kish and Shimei. His family had been among those with King Joachim of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So a number of Jews had actually returned to Jerusalem. Uh, if we read the book of Ezra, you can see that um, King Cyrus, Persian king, had decreed that the Jews be allowed to return and provided lots of funding for them. He'd given back a lot of the articles of gold and silver that had been taken from God's temple so that it could be taken back. And lots of Jews left, but Mordecai and his family had stayed. Now, there is, you know, some speculation about was it right that he didn't go back? And possibly. We don't know whether he was too comfortable living in, uh, you know, in Persian culture and was quite enjoying it and didn't actually want to go back and help rebuild the temple and settle back in Jerusalem. I'd have thought that, you know, if you were really passionate and on fire for God and his temple, you'd be the first to sign up. But then again, I don't know whether it was a case of signing up or whether you just were allowed or not allowed. But you can read into this uh, all you like. Um, we don't know. We know that he did one good thing, which was he adopted uh, Esther, whose Hebrew name is Hadassah. His per her Persian name is Esther. Um, he adopted her. He's actually her cousin, but old enough to be her father um, because Esther's parents had died. And so he adopted her. And that is a character of God. You know, he, he looks out for the orphans and the widows. He's adopted us because we were all orphans at one point. Um, he's adopted us into his family. And so Mordecai here is kind of demonstrating God's character by adopting Esther and raising her as his own daughter, as it says in verse 7. Uh, she was clearly very beautiful. And obviously, if you are a young, beautiful woman, you probably get treated differently to being an old, ugly man. You know, they're just, that's just the way society works. As much as we've, you know, there's this push for equality, I see it, you know, I've seen it in the, you know, in the church. If, if there's a, I think at one point, a few years back, there were two sisters, and one was a bit young, uh, much prettier. And me and Grace noticed that she'd often get better treatment from people in the church. Just because, you know, a pretty face, I, it's, it, unfortunately, that's human nature, isn't it? And I noticed that with my own children. You know, we might be outside as a family. Uh, I think there's one time we were uh, picking up litter. And B gets given something, Matthias doesn't. You know, that's, um, unfortunately, that's how it is. Um, and so... As a, if, you're, if you've got a beautiful face and you're a beautiful woman, you, you can, if you are um, maybe thinking about yourself, can use that for your advantage, can use that for your gain, you know? Um, it works. And uh, I think the other day we forgot to have our bins, um, we didn't put our bins out. And um, so we, uh, well, Grace, to her credit, took it to the front of our house on Harper Green Road and put it on the neighbours across the road from us, hoping, because their bins get collected a little bit later. Uh, but the, uh, the refuse collectors, to use the correct word, um, are very switched on and they notice if there's an extra bin. They're like, that person's got two bins, that's not right. And I heard them talking um, as they were approaching the bin and I'm thinking, oh, it's not going to get collected, is it? or well, they're not going to collect our neighbor's bins as well, and we're going to be to blame because we tried to kind of get our bin collected late. Um, and I, in my head, I was thinking, oh, I was going to call Grace and think, Grace, could you just go out so you can you know, like sweet talk these, uh, these bin men into uh, you know, doing us a favor and collecting our bin, even though we didn't put it out in time. But I was like, nope, I'll go out. <laughs> <laughs> and I just pleaded with these, uh, with these uh, guys to collect our bin. Because they're like, oh, no, you should have put it out, mate. You should have put it out in time. 
Um, and I just went, oh, come on, please. Uh, and they did. So I, that was good. But I know that they probably would have been a bit more favorable to uh, Grace just because she's a woman. And so, you know, men don't have it hard at all. But um, there are things that women can do if um, that men can't. Um, and so she, some, uh, there are women who will use this to their advantage, to benefit them personally. And from reading this, w it's very clear that Esther doesn't use it for her personal gain. Um, let's have a look at why that is the case. So verse 8, as a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Hegai's care. So I don't think she had a choice. Um, obviously, most, these women will probably, most likely, have been taken against their will. Um, and Esther could have put up a fight, I imagine. Or he, uh, Mordecai maybe could have. And this is where there's some uncertainty. You might think, if Mordecai was uh, a true follower of God, maybe he'd have tried to hide Esther. You know how, like, Moses was hidden? Um, obviously, it's a bit easier to hide a baby, maybe, than a full... Uh, although I think she's probably around 15, 16 at this time. That's what people speculate based on dates. Um, but maybe he could have tried to hide her. Because you'd think, well, why allow someone to get taken into this kind of evil place where she's just going to be used um, by the king? and exploited. But Esther and Mordecai, there's no sign in the biblical text that uh, they resisted. And the question is, you know, should we, have, should we resist? And I think as Christians, or as humans, we like rules, don't we? We like rules. And the more and more I think about you know, the Word of God and everything that goes on, the characters, is that it's not always clear-cut what the right thing to do is in any situation. You know, she had very little choice. Um, is it right to go along with what the uh, king has ordered? Or, knowing what's going to happen, should, should we refuse and reject and resist? You know, because I guess, you know, some parts of the Bible say, you know, there's no authority that other than what God's placed there. Submit yourself to the ruling authorities. But then equally, you know, it will be flee sexual immorality. And, you know, let's not get confused about this. It's not, uh, this is very much immoral. However, there is a God who judges righteously and fairly and knows everything that is within our power, within is, with, is within our control, you know, um, and he knows everything that's not within our power and not within our control. And so, my view on this is that Esther goes along with this, but knows that she serves a God who judges righteously and knows what is up to her and what's not up to her and can trust God. So Hegai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Now, so this has effectively become Esther's job. You know, um, as much as we might think you know, it's a horrible thing to have to do. It was her job. She was kind of probably forced into this job. And so she could have just protested and just made life really, really awkward, really awful, been, you know, not compliant at all, and just kicked up a stink. But in our jobs, you know, many of us have jobs, and we probably don't work for a Christian organization. Um, and yet, it's so important in our jobs 
to have a good name, to earn a good reputation. And clearly Esther does this from literally the minute, minute one. And very quickly, she gets favor from Haggai. And we see this with a lot of the you know, heroes in the Bible. If you see Joseph, you know, when even though he was trafficked, human trafficked to Egypt, he actually very quickly gained prominence, gained favor from people who didn't worship his God. Uh, similarly, we see Daniel. You know, Daniel, who uh, was taken into captivity very quickly, promoted, given responsibility, shown favor, earned a good name. And there's lots of different examples. And so, even though we live in a world that doesn't worship Jesus as king, we can still bring him glory by the way we act when we're at work. It's one of the biggest things we can do as Christians. We are the church here to gather together. But more importantly, we are God's representatives in the world. And do we bring him glory? And when we bring God glory, we earn a good name. And this is what happened with Esther. Um, so she, she receives all this favor and favorable treatment and gets the best place in the harem. Obviously, if she had a choice, she wouldn't be in the harem in the first place. But she is, and these are the circumstances we find ourselves in. And I guess sometimes as Christians, we can often think that we pray that God changes our circumstances. Take me away from this circumstance. Take me away from this situation. Sort out what's going on around me. But what we can really should be praying is, God, give me the right heart attitude in whatever circumstance I find myself in now. And I believe that that's how Esther conducted herself for her entire life up to that point. Because if we read verse 10, and again, this is another one that we might think, hmm, is that right? Well, let's look at it. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. So the question is, should she have like, told uh, everyone about the fact that she was Jewish, that she was a Jew? And I guess, you know, you might say, you know, as a Christian, go into your workplace, tell everyone you're a Christian. But there's, it's not as clear cut as this, is it? What Esther's do, done first is actually earned a good name. She's told everyone she's a Jew by the way she acts. Because the Jews were meant to behave differently to all the other people around them. They were meant to reflect God. And so she's doing that. She's been told by her, I guess, adopted father, Mordecai, not to tell anyone of her nationality and family background. Has she kind of argued against that? No, she's kind of honored Mordecai and submitted to his direction. So she was, you know, ob obedient. She wasn't rebellious. She'd done as she was instructed. And, you know, it might have been tempting to do that because she might have wanted to bring glory to her people. You know, oh, by the way, yes, I know you think I'm great and actually I'm a Jew. So she might have wanted to do that, but she didn't. In a workplace, the worst thing you can do is go around telling everyone you're a Christian and then being a terrible employee. <laughs> Don't do, you know, if you just bang on about how you're Christian and everything and how you're praying and go to church and read your Bible and then just be the, a terrible employee that causes all sorts of problems, is lazy, doesn't work hard, um, gets into, you know, arguments or causes HR issues and stuff like that. That's the worst thing you can do, you know? Because we, our actions should demonstrate our faith and our belief, and our relationship with Jesus. Um, so she doesn't. Then it says, verse 11, every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. To her. So he cares. You know, 
Some people have suggested that Mordecai was weak and allowed this to happen and then was worried for him, you know, what he'd done. Um, but we don't know. Again, not, you know, no character in the book of Esther is perfect. Uh, every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. So you could, you know, clearly he cares about her. Um, verse 12, before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Um, I don't know whether, maybe they, they didn't have all the fancy cosmetics that we have today, uh, and they needed that long, but that is a long time. Um, probably explains there were that many women that the king had um, brought into his room. Then it says, verse 13, when it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. Um, that evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem uh, where the king's wives lived. Um, where am I? There, sh there she would be under the care of Shaz Shazgath, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines, she would never go to the king again unless he had especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abigail, who was Mordecai's uncle. Uh, Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin Esther. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Hegai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. So... I mean, the fact that it says that, we should probably read into something that she accepted the advice of Hegai, which suggests that maybe there were others that didn't. You know, and clearly Esther is someone who accepts the advice and instruction of other people who may have something to offer in terms of wisdom. Too often we go through life sometimes thinking, we know best, um, I know what I'm doing, don't need to listen to anyone. But Esther here, we can look at her example of, actually, she's listening to Mordecai. She's listening to Hegai. Uh, she's following their instructions. It's a good trait to have. Um, where is it? Yeah, she asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. That's everyone. You know, obviously... Um, she, she's outward, outwardly, she's very beautiful, but inwardly, and her character, very admirable. And, and people like people that are listeners, you know? Um, the Bible says to, you know, listen a lot and speak less. And actually, when we listen to people, people enjoy being around us. I don't, um, sometimes, you know, you can be around someone who just wants to talk about themselves on and on and on and on, yeah? Whereas actually someone who listens to you is a really beautiful thing, isn't it? And you feel loved, you feel better about yourself, and you like that person. And I think Esther was probably very much like that. She wasn't obsessed about herself. She was willing to listen. She took the advice of other people and was admired as a result of that. And not just her, obviously, outward beauty. Um, verse 16, uh, Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign, and the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. And, you know, obviously we'd, we don't know everything about what's gone on here, but clearly there was something the king liked about Esther. Obviously very beautiful, but again, I think it was probably her character, the fact that she wasn't obsessed about herself, she was caring, she listened to others. Um, the king clearly probably had a lot to say and was a talker and a lot, a lot to um, talk about, and probably Esther listening to him rather than just say, you know, saying what she wants to say. Obviously, there is the stuff that probably went on uh, as well, and again, we might see this and go, well, should Esther have been involved in that situation? She probably had no choice again. You know, it was either die or do this. Um, and 
yeah, sometimes we can be, get very religious, can't we, about things. And, and uh, yeah, the Bible is not always clear cut, is it? It's full of people that are terrible people and God uses them. Um, and ultimately, God can use us even when we make mistakes. And clearly, lots of people in this story made mistakes, ended up in situations, but God is able to redeem those and use it for his glory. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a kind of mixed up story, but clearly, in the situation she finds herself in, she is trying to do her best. And you know, loving your enemies... Jesus loved his enemies. You know, he, 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 he was killed <laughs> by his enemies. Um, he allowed himself to be killed by his enemies. And, uh, you know, in this world, it's all about our rights. But actually, God calls us to lay down our lives. And obviously, this isn't a situation you would want any, you know, you wouldn't want your your wife, your daughters, your sisters, anyone to be in this sort of situation. But Esther does effectively lay down her life here. You know, she could try to save her life, but she was willing to um, give up her life in a horrible way, a horrible way. Um, but as a result, verse 18, it says, to celebrate, she is declared queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued her family background and nationality to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions just as she did when she lived in his home. So she's become queen. Much more powerful than Mordecai now. And yet she's still following his instructions. That speaks volumes for what she was like. You know, um, some people, they'll do everything uh, to listen to you when they're in a position of weakness. But as soon as they get a bit of authority, they'll just reverse and become very different and kind of, um, yeah, just use their authority and newfound authority and power. Um, you see that in films, you know, <laughs> it's a classic film story, isn't it? Someone weak and then suddenly they have this power or they become rich and they suddenly become a different person. Clearly Esther's not corrupted by power. Um, there's something in her character that is very Christ-like. You know, um, Jesus was always submitted to his Father's will. Uh, it doesn't matter whether, you know, whether he's in a position of weakness on the cross, he carried on doing it. Uh, always did. Um, yeah, so we can learn a lot from that. It doesn't matter, you know, how much power we have. It doesn't matter... Uh, who we are, we can still listen to godly advice. Anyway, Mordecai. So, Mordecai is a very loyal man. And as a result, he fostered loyalty in Esther. He, the best way to teach someone something is to live it. You know, Mordecai lived this loyalty because it says one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate two of the king's eunuchs Big Thana and Teresh who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters became angry at King Xerxes this was probably not uncommon because <laughs> he's a horrible man um, and plotted to assassinate him you might think that's a good thing to do you know just take out the king assassinate him but Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther she then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. She gave credit to Mordecai. She gave credit to Mordecai. 
Again, just like her beauty, she could have used it for her own personal gain. You know, how many times might we, you know, use something for our own personal gain? But if you want to be a real servant leader, when you have successes, you give credit to the people who worked with you, your team. You know, if you're a manager of a team, the success, a, a good manager will always give credit and success to the team. Uh, and when something goes wrong, they take responsibility for it bad manager or a bad leader will, when something goes wrong, will blame their team. <laughs> and when something goes right, will go, oh, I'm such a great manager and leader. You know, you see that in every walk of life, whether that's, you know, football, if you see football managers, uh, you know, Alex Ferguson, I guess, he is uh, probably one of the greatest uh, managers and leaders of our time. And whenever something went wrong, you know, he wouldn't criticize his players publicly. He'd speak to them. But in public, he would take responsibility. And when, when there was success, he would um, give credit to the players. And so, yeah, another good thing here is Mordecai is loyal to the king. And as a result, people were loyal to him. What we can't expect in life is to be completely unfaithful to everyone in our life and then expect people to be faithful to us. You know, if you're in a job and you are trying to build up a side business of your own, and maybe you're using the company resources to build up your own business so that one day you can leave and be your own boss. Um, if you do that, when you do become your own boss and you want to hire people, the very people you don't want to hire will be people just like you. Do you know what I mean? And so it's so hypocritical to be like that. And so we need to be demonstrating the things that we want to see in others. Um, let's have a look. Nearly finished. One day as Mordecai, yeah, so he's on the... Uh, he, Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. An investigation was made. Mordecai's story was found to be true. Truth. It's always best to be truthful. The truth never fails. Uh, two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This was recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. And that is really important because we'll come to that later about the fact it was recorded. Um, where is it? I think. Yeah. Did Mordecai become... Yeah, he was on duty at the king's gate. So he actually, he's been given a position of authority. So, yeah, so to, so to finish, um, all of, I think in conclusion, whatever situation we find ourselves in, and often those situations aren't a result of our own choosing. You know, none of us choose where we're born, who our parents are, what sort of family situation we're born into whether we're born into lots of money and power or whether we're born into uh, poverty and um, chaos. God knows what we're responsible for. And in every circumstance, we need to model Jesus. You know, giving up our lives, uh, submitting to the will of those in authority to us, you know, submitting to the Father's will just as Jesus did. Submission, really important. Uh, being loyal, um, giving credit to others, thinking about others. You know, if you see King Xerxes and Esther, King Xerxes, does he ever think about anyone else other than himself? No. Esther, does she ever think about other people other than herself? Yes, probably all the time. And as a result, she is honored. And we'll see later that she then uses that to save other people. And throughout the story, she um, lives for others. And we need to be people who live for others, whatever situation we find ourselves in. Um, in no way, you know, is the Bible condoning the stuff that's going on, the stuff that Esther's having to go through. Uh, a lot of people will go, oh, the Bible's got slavery in it. Oh, it's pro-slavery. The Bible's got sexual 
um, immorality in it, it can, condones that. It's got murder in it, it must condone murder. It's got genocide, genocide in it, it, needs, it condones genocide. Um, it doesn't. If you, if you read the Bible with the Holy Spirit helping you, you learn God's heart and you know that he um, is very, very angry about lots of evil that happens in the world. He's very, very patient and loving and wants to see all of us um, live lives to the full and live the lives, live lives the way he wanted us to live, where, the way he intended us to live when he created the world and, called, and said everything was good. Um, but in all these difficult situations we find ourselves in, we can still honor God and honor those people he's put in authority around us. Um, so yeah, be more Esther. Thank you. <laughs>